decisions all the time with incomplete information, with uncertain information, um, and we do that in decisions all the time that we're familiar with. Choosing a college, choosing a partner, choosing medical treatments, making investments, buying a home. We make these kinds of decisions all the time, not knowing the outcomes with certainty. Um, it's important that we learn how to deal with uncertainty, that we learn how to deal with, with situations in which you're making decisions with incomplete information. You can't be frozen by a lack of complete information or imperfect information. So what I would like for you to think about what to take away from uh, this, this talk this, this evening are a few key things. One is um, that we really know despite what you may see in, in some of the debates um, that go on in the press and reading online, that in fact scientists know a great deal about the climate, about how it operates, how it's changing, the causes of those changes, the risks that are associated with it, um, options for dealing with it, that we really have quite a bit of good solid information. There's also a lot of things that we still don't know very well yet, that there are some areas in which we have uncertainties where we need to try and get a better understanding of things. But we do have a good handle on the basics. And from that we can make some basic choices um, um, to figure out what we're going to be doing. So we need to figure out, so one of the things that you, know, you should be thinking about is how do you go about evaluating the information that is available. Okay? There's a lot of good information available, easily accessible. A lot of it is misinformation. All right? My job here this evening is not to tell you what is the right information, what's correct, what's true. All right? What you need to be getting out of an education as a college student is the skills to make your own judgments and assessments, to figure out as you look at information, as you read things, as you hear speakers, as you listen to me, that you have some skepticism, that you ask questions, and that you make some intelligent decisions about what sources of information have credibility, what information has credibility, and how are you going to act on that information. So that's, that's sort of a basic underlying theme this evening. Um, start off by, by uh, offering a disclaimer. One, I'm going to be talking a lot about climate science this evening. I am not a climate scientist. I'm not a physical scientist. I'm a social scientist who's been doing research on the effects of climate change, on the factors that make people places vulnerable to climate variability, climate hazards, climate change, on strategies for adapting to climate change to reduce those risks. Okay? So I'll be talking about a lot about the science, but I'm not a scientist. In that respect, I'm in a position similar to you, that I'm looking at all this information about the climate science, hearing about these debates that are going on in the public press okay, uh, and online, trying to figure out what's credible information, what's reliable information. And so I can share with you some ideas about how to go about doing that. One advantage that I've had is having worked in this area for 20 years, that I've spent a good deal of my time working with some of the top climate scientists in the world. Um, so while not having a science degree, I've got a pretty good layman's understanding of, of a lot of these issues. All right, there's some. Um, Bill Andrig at Stanford University has uh, used the, uh, an analogy of cancer and diagnosis of cancer as, as a way to uh, get into the topic of climate change um, and thinking about how you make decisions. Um, so, you know, for a moment, sort of bear with me on this and think about if you're diagnosed with cancer, what do you do? Okay. Um, well, you're going to want to get a sense of is the test that you had, was it reliable? Is it credible? Um, how accurate is that test? How often are there false positives in that kind of a test? Are there other tests available that you might be able to have that can give you further information? Okay. Um, get a second opinion. Okay. Who are you going to go to for a second opinion? Probably not your general practitioner. Probably not your family doctor. You want to go to an oncologist. Better yet, find one of the best oncologists in your area. Okay. Go and seek out expertise that's true expertise um, for, for the issues that you're dealing with. Um, learn about treatment options. How effective are the different options? What are the side effects? What are the risks associated with them? Um, what's the prognosis of what your future might be like pursuing different treatments or deciding not to have a treatment at all? What will be the outcomes that, that you might expect from those? Um, are there some things that you might change in your diet, in your personal behaviors, in your lifestyle that can increase the likelihood of positive outcomes? Okay. Um, so these are the kinds of things that are similar. They're analogous to some of the things that we've, 
we'd be talking about and making decisions about what do we do about the potential risk of, of climate change. So we can apply similar approaches there. Um, so one of the things you might think about is, all right, well, who are the experts on climate change? Who's credible? Uh, what sources of information might I trust? So when you read or hear something about climate change, ask yourself some basic questions about what expertise does this individual have? Do they have relevant science degrees? Okay. Do they have peer-reviewed publications in this area? Are they an active researcher or are they somebody who's sitting on the sidelines just, just offering opinions on, on an area that's a very active area of research? Is the work that they're publishing being cited by others? Are they respected in their field as somebody with expertise? Looking at uh, reports from different organizations. What's the mission of those organizations? Who are their members? What's their funding sources? Are they an advocacy group? Or are they really a science organization? Uh, looking at published sources, peer-reviewed science journals, peer-reviewed reports of science agencies, uh, reports of national science academies, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Look for sources of information that go through significant peer review and have good, good credibility. Okay. So carrying this analogy of uh, uh, cancer and diagnosis of cancer a little further, uh, so let's look at uh, our patient of the climate. What symptoms does it present? It presents a number of symptoms in terms of rising temperatures, uh, melting ice, uh, reduced snow cover, ocean uh, uh, heat uh, content rising, changes in precipitation, sea level rise, acidification of oceans, a number of things. Okay, so let's look at some of these in a little bit more detail. Um, this is a data set that's now become pretty iconic in, in climate change. This is uh, a data set from NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Um, it is taking uh, data from about a thousand meteorological stations around the world um, uh, where they're using hourly observations, data from those stations, and aggregating those in some way using a variety of methods in order to come up with this thing called global average temperature. Okay, something none of us ever see, feel, touch, experience, but it's a good indicator of what's happening to a system at a large global scale. Okay? And if, when you look at this data set, all right, you know, it's quite apparent here that it's showing this warming trend, particularly in the latter part of the, of the 20, uh, 20th century. Okay? That's quite clear in that data set. Well, is that... Are there other data sets that show something different or something similar? Well, these are some of the other global data sets which have done similar things. One in the United Kingdom at the Met Office, the Hadley Center. Uh, NOAA in the U.S. also has their own global, global data set on surface temperatures. Japanese Meteorological Agency. And you'll see from this that all of these are finding the same trend. Slight differences in these data sets, but basically the story is the same. Recently, there's been a lot of news about a, a new effort uh, at the Berkeley Earth uh, Surface Temperature Study. Um, this has been led by a scientist who had presented himself as being skeptical about climate science, and he wanted to do his own analysis of data sets. And the expectation was that he was going to find something quite different from what NASA did in NOAA and the Met Center in the UK and the Japanese had found. Um, and these are uh, uh, the results from the Berkeley group along with uh, uh, some of these other data centers and basically you get the same thing. What you see is over the past say half century about a 0 0.8, 0 0.9 degrees centigrade rise in, in uh, temperatures globally. Okay. Let's look at that uh, not just globally but here's a figure from the IPCC. The part to focus on in this figure, uh, we might talk about some of the rest of it later, but the black lines in each of these that shows T temperature observations uh, averaged uh, for North America, for Europe, for South America, Africa, Asia, Australasia. Okay, same story in each one of these. Okay, it's, it's, this isn't some figment of some global average. This is something that's being observed and seen in uh, each of these continents. Okay, what other symptoms do we see that that might go along with the story of of uh, rising uh, surface temperatures? Well. The oceans are an important part of the story, okay? A good deal of the energy from, uh, from the sun is being stored in the ocean as we have this greenhouse effect. That's where a lot of that initial heating is going into. And a variety of studies with different data sets have found that the oceans are also heating up, that there's more heat in the oceans than there had been in earlier years. We can look at sea, Arctic sea ice extent, and that's the data set for that, showing a trend of melting of sea ice, that there's less uh, the extent of sea ice is, is declined. The volume of sea ice in the Arctic has also declined over time. 
uh, glaciers. This is one particular glacier in, uh, in Canada, in Jasper Park, showing in 1919 and 2005. This kind of figure, you can find that replicated for many other glaciers around the world. Um, the, the majority of glaciers have shown a similar process of having retreated and melted over time. Uh, sea level rise, the sea level rise as we have this you know, glacial melt as we have warming of the oceans. Um, both of those contribute to uh, sea level rise and we see about an eight inch rise in sea level over uh, a period of, of about the last century. So multiple sources of data, multiple lines of evidence, each of these showing a story of what's, what's going on with, with the Earth's climate. So what are the possible causes? Why might these changes be happening? Okay. Well, we've got plate tectonics as being one possibility, but that operates over time scales of millions of years. So that's not really what's going to explain what we're seeing happening um, over the last century or recent decades. Astronomical, basically that means looking at changes in energy fluxes, how much uh, solar energy is reaching the top of the atmosphere of the Earth, uh, how much is reaching the surface. That varies depending on changes in, in Earth's orbit. There are cycles of the Earth's orbit that um, it varied over different time scales of 100,000, 40,000, 20,000 years, which are largely responsible for the ice ages uh, that we've observed over the last nearly million years or, or more. Um, atmospheric aspects, changes in, in the atmosphere that affect how much sunlight is reflected back out to space before it gets down to the surface, how much uh, energy, uh, thermal energy is retained in the atmosphere that does reach the Earth's surface, changes in albedo that changes the amount of, of, uh, uh, of uh, sunlight that gets reflected back to space or gets absorbed uh, by different systems in the Earth. Okay. Uh, the greenhouse effect being one of these, uh, um, and that's the main focus this evening. One of the things which I want you to be aware of, because I think a lot of people have this idea that this, the idea of this greenhouse effect is new. This is something you know, uh, uh, that scientists have only come across, uh, this, come up with this idea in the last few decades. Well, if you go back to Joseph Fourier, a scientist of uh, the 18th century, um, he was uh, you know, looking at the evidence of uh, the Earth's temperature, its warm, its climate, okay? and doing mathematical calculations of how warm should this planet be given how close we are to the sun and the amount of energy that's coming in and how much energy should be lost every day going back out into space okay, and finding that there's a big discrepancy. The Earth's climate is significantly warmer than it would be based on just simple physics if there isn't some kind of insulation that is holding energy in the system, and that's the atmosphere. So Fourier's contribution here was he was the first one to hypothesize that the atmosphere is acting as some kind of an insulator to hold energy in the Earth's system. John Tyndall, uh, this gentleman over here, stern-looking fellow, um, he was uh, the first one to actually do some calculations of how much do these gases uh, absorb um, uh, radiant heat. Okay, so he did this for water vapor, for carbon dioxide, some other gases in the 1850s, and was the first one to make some accurate calculations of, of that greenhouse effect of these gases. Savant Ar Arrhenius, this gentleman here, uh, in 1896, uh, the story is partly because he was brokenhearted from being divorced, had a lot of time on his hands, and by hand calculated uh, how much the Earth's average temperature would change for both a reduction in CO2 by about 50% and an in a doubling of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and made some calculations from that. His interest was whether that might explain the ice ages, going from, from glacial periods to interglacial periods. Um, turns out that he was kind of on the wrong track for that, but it was some useful insights for understanding some other aspects of the way greenhouse gases influence the Earth's climate. Uh, Roger Revelle and Hans Seuss, um, uh, quite a bit later, um, up until uh, this time, the assumption had been that much of the uh, carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere when we burn coal, oil, natural gas, is being taken up by oceans, is being taken up by vegetation, and that the stuff really isn't going to accumulate very quickly in the atmosphere. So Arrhenius, when he did his calculations trying to figure out what would happen to the average temperature if you double CO2, he thought that was centuries off in the future. Okay? that CO2 was going to be taken up by oceans and, and uh, bios, the biosphere um, and not accumulate very quickly. Well, it was Ravel and Seuss who thought, well, you know, let's take a look at this more closely and looked at the carbon cycle and the science of the carbon cycle. And they're the ones who pro proposed at that point that, you know, there are some signals here, there's some, some things here that make us believe 
that those systems are not taking up carbon dioxide as much as we had previously assumed. Okay? It's largely a hypothesis. Charles Keeling, this fellow down here who was a student of Ravel's, um, took up that challenge and said, well, let's start measuring this more carefully. He developed a system of, uh, to measure CO2 accurately um, and started the first long-term measurement of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, to see what was going on with, with that. And so that gives us some evidence of really what's happening with, with the carbon cycle. Um, just backing up a second here to you know, talk just very basically about green, the greenhouse effect, because I'm not sure how familiar you are with what that is and how that operates. Um, the basic idea here is from the sun, we've got incoming solar radiation, visible light, relatively short wave radiation. Uh, this visible light passes through the atmosphere. Um, greenhouse gases don't block it, absorb it, okay? Clouds can reflect it, so some portion gets reflected back out to space, but much of it reaches the Earth's surface, okay? Some of that gets reflected off snow and ice, uh, um, uh, other surfaces on the Earth, but much of it, about half of it, um, gets absorbed by uh, the Earth, okay? Well, what happens then? The Earth's surface warms, it radiates thermal, thermal radiation, um, longer wave radiation, and that radiation, as it's being re, uh, radiated up from the Earth's surface, okay, what happens there is greenhouse gases, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, that those gases absorb thermal energy, thermal radiation, okay, and then scatter it. And so this is the effect that is warming the Earth's climate. If we didn't have these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it would be, and I'm, so those, these gases are all there by natural processes as well as human ones, okay? If the ones, that the, the background amount that are there naturally, if they weren't in the atmosphere, our climate would be about 59 degrees colder than it is, okay? So this is, this is well accepted physics, okay? This is part of how we understand how our earth works, the climate system works. As we increase the concentrations of those gases in the atmosphere, we amplify that effect. And we increase the amount of energy that's being retained in the system, and that's going to lead to heating of the uh, warming of the climate. Okay? Um, all right, so let's look at the record of, of what's going on in terms of uh, emissions of carbon dioxide. Uh, this graph shows from burning uh, fossil fuels, uh, estimates of how much CO2 has been released globally. Um, that it's, uh, particularly after World War II, substantial, substantial increase in the amount of CO2 as populations rise, as incomes rise, and with those, uh, uh, burning of fossil energy goes up. Where is that energy going? Where, or where's that carbon going? What happens to that carbon? Um, so this is a, a real simple diagram of the carbon cycle. Um, and, you know, the reason why prior to Ravel and Seuss, what the, everyone thought was, well, basically you've got huge amounts of carbon going into the atmosphere, uh, or going into the atmosphere from respiration, huge amounts coming into vegetation from photosynthesis. Uh, we've got a huge exchange going on between the atmosphere and the oceans, um, and only, say, 7 billion tons of carbon going to the atmosphere from burning fossil energy, okay? Well, that's enough to throw the system out of balance, okay? But that's enough so that what we're seeing is an accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is the uh, uh, data that was collected by uh, uh, Charles Keeling and then others after him, showing uh, CO2 concentrations at Mauna Loa uh, beginning in 1958. And you see these large fluctuations each year showing seasonal variations between northern hemisphere uh, winter and summer. Um, but there's a steady increase, up, 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 so that when this, this data was first being collected, it's down around 315 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And now we're up, um, actually this, if we continue this on to the present, we're up over 390 parts per million of, of CO2 in the atmosphere now. Similar things have happened for, this shows uh, methane and nitrous oxide, as well as carbon dioxide. This time we're going back 2,000 years, and we're seeing very much higher concentrations of these gases in the present than we did in the past. Okay. What about the very distant past? Um, we're able, through ice cores um, uh, drilled in uh, Antarctica and in Greenland, to reconstruct the amount of carbon dioxide that's been in the atmosphere going back now. This figure only goes back 650,000 years. Uh, the most recent uh, deepest ice cores can give us now uh, back to about 850,000 years. And this shows a sort of fluctuation. It's, it's, like, it's almost like a timepiece, like a clock. 
uh, that you see this regularity of this fluctuation going on uh, with, with CO2. What that's doing is it's following, it's mimicking what's going on with the Earth's orbit. Okay, that um, as the orbit is, changes the, you know, how much solar radiation is reaching northern hemisphere, particularly in the summer, causing the planet to go into uh, uh, warmer periods called interglacials or going into glacial periods uh, where it's quite cold um, uh, with fair regularity over time periods of, so, you know, the interglacials are maybe, so these are the warmer periods are maybe about 10, 15,000 years long. The glacial periods are more on the order of 80, 100,000 years. And this is showing you what's happened there over time. During the glacial period, CO2 concentrations have averaged about 180 to 190 parts per million. Uh, during the interglacials, closer to 270, 280 parts per million. Um, what about now? This is showing not quite to the present. This is to up to about the uh, uh, beginning of the industrial era. That's what's happened with the industrial revolution. That's unprecedented over at least 850,000 years. Probably with this planet hasn't seen concentrations of CO2 that high for two, three million years. Okay? This is what's meant when, when you, if you've heard the phrase of we're conducting this global experiment, okay, where we really are changing this planet in ways that has not happened in hundreds of thousands of years, if not a couple of million years. Okay? There have been times in the very distant past, going back many millions of years, where there have been even higher concentrations, but primates, uh, um, uh, pre-humans and humans did not live during that period of time, so I'm not, I don't know how relevant that would be. Okay? All right, so now let's look at, um, you know, is what I've just described there in terms of what's happened with carbon dioxide, is that a cause of the changes that we've observed in temperatures, in oceans, in ice melt, um, is, is what's going on here. Um, this is what's referred to as fingerprint analysis, okay, where you look at evidence from a variety of types to, to try and understand what's going on. Um, a key part of this is looking at what's called measured forcings from, uh, there are a variety of things that, can, that, as I mentioned before, can cause the climate to change. There can be changes in the amount of solar output, okay. There can be changes in volcanic activity that puts sulfates high in the uh, atmosphere and can reflect uh, the sun. Uh, changes in greenhouse gas concentrations, changes in ozone concentrations, sulfate aerosols that reflect uh, um, uh, uh, sunlight. Okay. These things can be, we can look at those based on uh, basic laws of physics to understand what the outcomes are of those. And we can also use climate models, forcing them, meaning we input these different changes into those models to simulate how the Earth system would respond to each of those and look at them and then compare that to the evidence of what we actually have observed happen. So these, these predictions are actually backcasts, using a model to simulate the last century of climate and comparing that to the ob observed uh, climate. Okay? Um, so here's an example of, of that. This bottom figure here, okay, the black line shows the observed global mean surface temperature from 1900 to nearly the present. The light blue squiggly lines are different climate models that have been run with just natural forcings, meaning using what we've been able to put together about changes in solar output, changes in volcanic activity, and running those models and seeing, well, what, what should the outcome have been if that was the only thing causing climate to vary over this period of time? The dark blue gives the average across those models. We see, well, they're, they kind of cluster in the early part here, but once you get past the middle of the 20, 20th century, these things diverge substantially. Okay? The natural forcings are not doing a very good job of explaining what we actually observed in global sur mean surface temperature. The figure at the top takes those natural forcings that are included down here okay, and adds to that what humans have done adds to that the greenhouse gases, the greenhouse gases that we've put into the atmosphere, increasing their concentrations above the, the levels that had been observed uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution. And what do we get? We get a much closer match. Okay? This is, shows a, a pretty good you know, substantiation of what the, the basic physics tell us we should be observing and what the models, these complex models, are simulating for what's going on, telling us that we're getting a situation here where we think we can explain that both based on human forcings and natural forcings. Okay? We can also look at the, the spatial pattern of warming geographically. 
Um, greenhouse gas warming, um, what we would expect from that is greater warming at high northern latitudes and greater warming um, in continental interiors. And uh, that's in fact what we've observed. So this figure shows the observations of the change uh, for the period 2001 to 10 relative to an average for the period 1951 to 1980. Okay? So the pattern that we see there is what we would expect from the basic physics of, of greenhouse gas warming and from the climate models. Um, another figure here giving another look at this. This one is a little difficult, uh, tricky to read. Um, so if you take a look here, this is showing at the equator at the surface going up in the atmosphere to say 28, 30,000 kilometers above uh, the surface, okay? And showing the colors are showing uh, temperature change uh, in that column above the equator. This is at 30 degrees south latitude. This is 60 degrees south latitude. Same thing north and south, um, 30 degrees north, 60 degrees north, okay? The upper figure here shows the pattern of what you would expect if what was happening was increases in solar activity, okay? Basically getting warming pretty uniformly throughout um, uh, the atmosphere from the lower level of the atmosphere to the top of the atmosphere. Uh, this one here is for volcanic uh, uh, changes of what's going on. This one's just uh, greenhouse gases, what would happen there? A key factor here is you've got cooling in the stratosphere, warming in the lower at atmosphere. Um, this is for sulfate aerosols here. Wait, no, this is sulfate aerosols. Uh, let's see, D, E, no, that's sulfate aerosols. This one is for uh, uh, tropospheric and stratosphere, it goes on. This shows the combined effect of all of them. I don't have the figure here for it of what the actual observations are, but this is what the models and the physics say you would observe. And in fact, what we observe is we've got warming following a pattern similar to this in the lower part of the atmosphere and at the surface and cooling in the stratosphere. That is not what you would get if what was driving this was solar output changes as the primary driver. Okay, so um, the conclusion of all this is that our observed changes match the fingerprints of greenhouse gases plus natural forcings. It's these two things operating together, all right? So when we look at the temporal pattern of, of change, the change through the 20th century, it matches what we'd expect from these forcings. Uh, the geographic pattern in terms of high northern latitude warming, continental interior warming, uh, less warming over oceans, that matches these two uh, explanations working together. Uh, changes in rainfall patterns also match into this, okay? Observed changes, the, the, the changes we've observed in the climate are not consistent with what we would expect to see if the only thing going on were natural changes in, in the Earth's system. So the diagnosis, okay? Looking at the symptoms, looking at the different evidence, doing these tests, the diagnosis is climate is warmed and most of the warming since the mid-20th century is very likely due to human, due to greenhouse gases from human activities. Okay? And this context very likely has a specific meaning. This is from the IPCC, where that means that there's a 1 in 10 likelihood, 1 in 10 chance, that that conclusion could be wrong. Okay? Note, though, that that conclusion is stated in terms of most of the warming since the mid-20th century, okay? To conclude, you know, that for, it's, which that also means that it would be extremely likely, virtually certain, that at least some of the warming is from greenhouse gases. But there's at least a 9 out of 10 chance that it's mostly from greenhouse gases, and very unlikely that that's not the case. Climate's changing in other ways, too. We'll talk a bit about that in a moment. These are the conclusions of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's also the conclusion of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. It's also the conclusion of the National Science Academies of Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Italy, Japan, Russia, and the United Kingdom. I have not cherry-picked these. These are the only National Science Academies that have gone and reviewed and assessed and evaluated the evidence, and they support these conclusions. You can find individual scientists who may dispute these things, but all of the assessments that have been done that have brought together teams of scientists working with National Science Academies or with the IPCC look at the evidence that I presented and other evidence and come to these conclusions. Okay, prognosis, all right? So what, what can we expect? What, what uh, might the, uh, the patient experience in the future? 
So one of the things that we're going to be seeing is very likely is that emissions of greenhouse gases are going to continue to rise. Okay? They, uh, um, for most scenarios, are going to rise probably through the entire 21st century unless we deliberately, consciously make decisions to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases. There are some scenarios from the IPCC that suggest, well, there may be some other things, economic, technological things, that might drive emissions down for some scenarios. Okay? Uh, those are rather optimistic ones. But even in those cases, this part of the graph shows what happens to the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And for each of these, the CO2 concentration is rising from present day concentrations to levels um, of 450, 500 parts per million to as much as 800, 900 parts per million. And there are other scenarios that suggest could go higher than that. Okay? So our future, the, the prognosis is emissions of, of greenhouse gases are going to drive concentrations of CO2 and other greenhouse gases higher. What that means is we're going to be seeing increased temperatures. Global temperatures on average are going to rise. Okay? That, um, that range could be anywhere from another degree warming, which is extremely likely we're going to get at least that much. Uh, could be as high as 5, 6, and there's some cases, uh, projections that suggest even higher warming uh, in degrees centigrade. Along with that, um, we're likely to be exposed to some changes in extreme weather. Okay? Uh, we're probably going to see fewer cold days, and cold days are going to be not as cold as they have been in the past. That's a good thing. Uh, but some of the other changes that we're going to be seeing are more extremely hot days. They're going to be more frequent. We're going to see more heat waves. We're going to see more heavy rainfall events, more intense rainfall events. Uh, drought in those areas that are prone to being semi-arid and arid, that uh, more frequent uh, larger areas are likely to uh, experience drought. Um, cyclones, hurricanes, uh, um, likely to see increase in intensity, okay? Uh, whether there, there's an increase in frequency or not, uh, the, there's still quite a bit of un, unanswered questions on that, uh, but the, the current evidence points to very likely, uh, or likely that there would be uh, an increase in the intensity in those kinds of storms. I'm trying to put this in a context that it's a little bit easier to kind of get a sense of what does this mean, okay? Um, that I first saw one of these figures, this is from the Union of Concerned Scientists, um, which kind of helps me kind of get a sense of, you know, what does it mean if the climate warms by some amount? Um, this is for Pennsylvania. I couldn't find a similar diagram for, for uh, Maryland. Uh, but basically, okay, this is where I live is up in here, okay? And so depending on the scenario of how much emissions are in the future, how sensitive is the climate to the changes, um, by, you know, towards the end of the 21st century, um, central Pennsylvania, eastern Pennsylvania will be kind of like Virginia in its climate. Or maybe even like Georgia, southern Georgia. Okay? I used to live here in Montgomery County. Part of why I moved uh, to, to Pennsylvania was because I thought it was too hot and humid here. I found out I didn't go far enough north. Um, I wasn't, wasn't smart enough to, to go farther north. But that's not a climate I'm really uh, uh, wanting to, to experience. Fortunately, if that's towards the end of the century, I won't experience that. It'll be my kids and grandchildren. Um, this figure here shows uh, projected changes in the number of days over 90 degrees it might be experienced. In Harrisburg, that's currently about 15 days on average. Uh, um, that's what it was over this period, 61 to 1990. Um, in the near future, this is going to be more like 20, 25 uh, days per year. Uh, going out to mid-century, you know, 35. Uh, over 50 days, um, and even, even more in the future, okay? That's a lot of heat, okay? And with that come health effects. With that comes problems with, with a variety of, of health problems that go with extreme hot days. All right. Um, this figure is, is an interesting one, which I know you can't possibly really read that. Um, I'd encourage you to take a look at it in the original report from the IPCC. My reason for putting it up here uh, and teasing you with it is just basically to make a, a couple of basic points. One is that climate change will impact uh, many systems that are vital to our well-being. Okay? It, it's going to impact water resources, it's going to impact ecosystems, food, food security, coasts, coastal settlements, human health. Okay? All of these things are going to be affected by climate. All right? The scale going across the bottom here Okay, is indicated to show, and if you, if you were able to read these things here, give you a sense of over here where we're, you know, just say a degree of warming or so to one degree, two degrees of warming, you get a mixture of the effects include some good things, 
as well as some not so good things. Okay? As you move farther to the right, as we put more and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and get greater changes in the Earth's climate, okay, the bad things start to predominate. Okay? The good things are less common, less likely to happen. And the potential for some really bad things increases. Okay? It's really hard to get a handle on exactly where there might be a tipping point in this. It's hard to get good uh, uh, sense of what the effects will be, particularly since most of these effects that we care about are effects on people, on humans, on human settlements. And we're a wily group of, of, of critters. Okay? We can imagine and figure out a variety of strategies of how are we going to cope, change, adapt to these changes. All right? But one thing we can be sure of is we're going to be exposed to some stresses that are going to challenge us. And some of those challenges we're going to meet and meet well. Some of those challenges not so much. And some of those challenges are going to cause consequences that we are going to regret if we allow this system to continue in that direction. Uh, one example here is this is uh, crop yield uh, impacts uh, at different temperature changes for different latitudes, uh, different, different crops. Um, and as you see, there's, you know, for some of this, above that zero line means there's increasing yields. Um, but as you get further out at larger changes in temperature, uh, the pattern is more one of, of loss of yield. One of the troubling things about this is, and the evidence uh, is, is pretty consistent on this, is the places in the world where we're expecting to see decreases in crop yields with climate change is in the tropics, subtropics, these are the places where the developing countries are, the least developed countries are. This is sub-Saharan Africa. Okay? These are places where changes in crop yields really make a huge difference. Okay? So the greatest pressure stresses are going to be hitting on those who may be at least able to, to uh, deal with them. Um, so who's at risk? Um, well, we're all at risk. Some are more at risk than others. Okay? Um, what are the factors that determine who's the greatest risk, who's most vulnerable? Socioeconomic factors have a lot to do with it. Okay? People in poverty, marginalized populations, uh, people who earn their livelihoods from agriculture, particularly subsistence agriculture, or from fisheries or from forestry, those folks are, are at, at greater risk than some others. People who live in low-lying coastal areas, small islands, floodplains, are potentially at greater risk. Um, the arid, semi-arid areas also. Okay, have play, face some problems. Um, places that have poor governance um, institutions. Um, some of what we saw with uh, um, Hurricane Katrina, uh, Hurricane Sandy in terms of the impacts, uh, gives some evidence of poor governance having not planned well, not prepared well, and seeing greater impacts than um, might have been the case had we done a better job. Now think about that in the context of Darfur in Sudan. Okay? Changes in climate, more arid climate, more variable rainfall, less, less reliable rainfall in a country where you cannot depend on local government or national government to do much to help you. And in fact, they may be doing much to try and get in your way and cause you a good deal of trouble. Um, so those are places where risks and vulnerability can be extremely high. Um, what are the available treatments for, for this uh, uh, case of, of climate change? Mitigation is, is uh, one. Mitigation uh, simply is a term that's used for reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases or doing things to take those gases out of the atmosphere and, and store them in some way. Reducing the amount of fossil energy we use, replacing them with renewable energy, re using less energy, energy conservation, um, a variety of strategies there. Carbon sinks, we can be planting more trees or slowing down deforestation. All of these things can help slow the rate of climate change, and maybe if we're really, really aggressive about it, could stabilize the human changes in climate change. Okay? You can't stabilize the climate. The climate is naturally variable, but we can stop doing what uh, Wally Broker, a climate scientist at Columbia, refers to poking a beast with a stick. Okay? As we put CO2 in the atmosphere, we're poking a beast with a stick that could respond in ways that is unpredictable and we may not like and likely won't like. Um, adaptation is another treatment. 
um, is adaptation would be looking at what can we do to make ourselves less at risk to things like Hurricane Sandy? What can we do to have better coastal uh, preparedness for storms? Uh, what can we do to deal with food security issues so that if there are problems with food production that we make sure that there are ways to feed people who might not be able to, uh, to feed themselves? Um, doing a variety of things so that future development makes our societies more climate resilient, less sub subject to impacts of negative impacts of, of climate variability. Um, and another one which I put on here, geoengineering, which is a very controversial idea. Um, but there are some who argue that, well, we need to at least keep this on the table, okay? We need this as an option in our back pocket, because if we get in a situation where we think we might be triggering some really severe uh, things, such as you get to a point where you get a feedback effect of you think methane is going to start to be released from some northern uh, latitude peatlands, uh, uh, causing a large feedback. If you think the Amazon rainforest, which some, some analysis suggests uh, we could lose much of the Amazon rainforest, putting huge pulses of, of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we may want to use a geoengineering technique, which is basically, this is a polite way of saying, shooting a bunch of stuff up into the atmosphere deliberately to reflect sunlight away. Okay? Um, there's some less uh, uh, um, negatively impacting uh, strategies that are out there. Um, um, I won't go into those now, but that's, that's another set of treatments that we might, might consider. Um, something key to understand about all of this is the time frames in this and the inertia in these systems. Okay? So this simple diagram here is showing in the top emissions of greenhouse gases projected out into the future. Okay? And doing a couple of just simple what-if scenarios. Suppose we stabilized emissions um, at this level here and held them constant on into the future. All right? Pretty aggressive uh, uh, policy on climate change. What happens from that? Well, we keep the concentration of CO2 from going as high as it would have otherwise. Good thing to do. We'll probably have some benefit for us, but there's still going to be quite a bit of climate change that goes along with that. If we want to be serious about really taking some action and, say, stabilizing concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere so that we're no longer poking this beast with bigger and bigger sticks, Emissions need to drop dramatically, 80% or so in a very quick, short period of time, and that would correspond to a situation where we can flatten that off and stabilize concentrations of greenhouse gases at, at some level that we hope will not be dangerous. That includes developed countries and developing countries. This is just from you know, one, one depiction uh, uh, from Climate Interactive of, of how that might be distributed across, across these different countries, lots of different ways you can do it. The basic message is, the big emitters of greenhouse gases would all need to do this. We would all need to dramatically reduce our emissions if we're going to stabilize a concentration of, of car greenhouse gases at, at some level that's not going to be up at seven, eight, nine hundred parts per million. There are existing technologies that we can address this problem with. Okay? This is uh, some analysis that's from Amory Lovins. Uh, this is out of his, his recent book, uh, Reinventing Fire. Um, uh, it may be a relatively optimistic picture of the future, um, but it, it's, this is based all on technologies that currently exist and looking at ways that we might accelerate how they're introduced, diffused into the economy, become commercially uh, available. So here we are uh, in the present where we're using a lot of oil, coal, some nuclear, a lot of natural gas and growing, um, and looking at over time, different ways in which these things can be ramped down so that we're relying less and less on fossil energy, using natural gas as a transition fuel, okay? expanding the amount of renewables that we use, solar energy, wind energy, um, biomass, uh, some other renewables. Okay? Um, also doing a lot to introduce more efficient technologies, uh, conservation measures, uh, doing some, some very integrative uh, um, um, just really Im imaginative ways of thinking about how we can redesign systems to use much less energy than they currently do. Um, I really recommend this book by Amory Lovins that you should take a look at it. Um, I think it can be criticized as being, it's a pretty optimistic picture of what the future can be, but it is a feasible future. Okay? It's one that if we decide that's the direction we want to go in, we can make something like that happen. Okay, so this is my last slide here. Um, uh, basically, um, um, what I want to just sort of bring us back to here is thinking about making decisions, making decisions in a context of uncertainty. This is a fairly typical standard kind of diagrams that you, you see in discussions of risk management. 
Um, and I've described kind of this process of, of how we've gone through, uh, you know, identifying problems and what our decision criteria are, assessing risks, identifying options, making decisions, implementing them, monitoring and reviewing. And the idea of this being, a, you know, this sort of cyclical thing is it's not, this is not a problem where we're going to make a decision and fix it today for the next umpteen decades and centuries. This is something we deal with year by year, decade by decade, constantly evaluating, monitoring, making new decisions, figuring out what's working, figuring out what more we need to do, okay? A problem that we're in right now is we've kind of gotten stuck in this thing is this little loop here where for decades now we keep on assessing risks, identifying options, we talk about them, we debate them, and the stuff that we implement are these uh, fairly weak voluntary sorts of things, very, very minor programs, mostly research and development spending kinds of things, and not really making some big decisions about moving on further in, in that direction. I don't think we have uh, time to continue to do this in that way. Okay, I think we're going to be uh, needing to push forward and starting to think you know, some, about some really big major changes. Um, um, I think continuing in that sort of loop there is irresponsible. I think it's also unethical. Um, that's something though which, you know, I'm not telling you that that is the, the reality, the truth. That's something which you need to bring your own uh, uh, values to and your assessment of the information and the science and, and some of the ethical issues. Um, what I'd encourage you to do, though, is, you know, don't go away from this having thought, oh, that was an interesting lecture or tedious and dull, whatever your opinion is, and forget about it, okay? This is serious stuff, okay? This is one of the fundamental challenges that we're facing, okay? I'm hoping that some of you, if not all of you, will have taken away from this the notion that I need to learn more about this. I need to figure out whether this guy is right or not so right or partially right or whether somebody else is and figure out for yourself what should be done and then do something about it. Talk to your legislators at a local level. Talk to them at a state level. Whoever gets elected at the end of, of today, put a bug in their ear about what to do. Okay? Whatever it is you think is the right thing to do, don't sit back complacently, become active, do something. This is something that really is important. Whatever position you end up taking on this, this is a fundamentally important set of choices for our society and for the world. And I'll take any questions. <laughs>